Chapter 1. The Rock Star Eleven-year-old John Romero jumped onto his dirt bike, heading for trouble again. A scrawny kid with thick glasses, he pedaled past the modest homes of Rockland, California, to the round table pizza parlor. He knew he wasn't supposed to be going there this summer afternoon in 1979. But he couldn't help himself. That's where the games were. Specifically, what was there was asteroids, or as Romero put it, the coolest game planet Earth has ever seen. There was nothing else like the feeling he got tapping the control buttons as the rocks hurled toward his triangular ship, and the Jaws-style theme music blipped in suspense. Dum, 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 dum. Romero mimicked these video game sounds the way other kids did celebrities. Fun like this was worth risking everything. The crush of the meteors, the theft of the paper route money, the wrath of his stepfather. Because no matter what Romero suffered, he could always escape back into the games. At the moment, what he expected to suffer was a legendary whipping. His stepfather, John Schooneman, a former drill sergeant, had commanded Romero to steer clear of the arcades. Arcades bred games. Games bred delinquents. Delinquency bred failure in school and in life. As his stepfather was fond of reminding him, his mother had had enough problems trying to provide for Romero and his younger brother, Ralph, since her first husband left the family five years earlier. His stepfather was under stress of his own with a top-secret government job retrieving black boxes of classified information from downed U.S. spy planes across the world. Hey, little man, he had said just a few days before, consider yourself warned. Romero did heed the warning, sort of. He usually played games at Timothy's, a little pizza joint in town. This time, he and his friends headed into a less traveled spot, the round table. He still had his initials, A.J.R. for his full name, Alfonso John Romero, next to the high score here, just like he did on all the asteroids machines in town. He didn't have only the number one score. He owned the entire top ten. Watch this, Romero told his friends as he slipped into a quarter and started to play. The action didn't last long. As he was about to complete a round, he felt a heavy palm grip on his shoulder. What the fuck, dude? He said, assuming one of his friends was trying to spoil his game. Then his face smashed into the machine. Romero's stepfather dragged him past his friends to his pickup truck, throwing the dirt bike in the back. Romero had done a poor job of hiding his bike, and his stepfather had seen it while driving home from work. He really screwed up this time, little man, his stepfather said. He led Romero into the house. Romero's mother and his visiting grandmother stood in the kitchen. Johnny was at the arcade again, his stepfather said. You know what that's like? That's like telling your mother, fuck you. He beat Romero until the boy had a fat lip and a black eye. Romero was grounded for two weeks. The next day, he snuck back into the arcade. Romero was born resilient, his mother Ginny said. A four and a one half pound baby delivered on October 28th, 1967. Six weeks premature. His parents, married only a few months before, had been living long in hard times. Ginny, good humored and easygoing, met Alfonso Antonio Romero when they were teenagers in Tucson, Arizona. Alfonso, a first-generation Mexican-American, was a maintenance man at an Air Force base, spending his days fixing air conditioners and heating systems. After Alfonso and Ginny got married, they had headed in a 1948 Chrysler with $300 to Colorado, hoping their interracial relationship would thrive in more tolerant surroundings. Though the situation improved there, the couple returned to Tucson after Romero was born so his dad could take a job in the copper mines. 
The work was hard, the effects sour. Alfonso would frequently come home drunk if he came home at all. There was soon a second child, Ralph. John Romero savored the good times, the barbecues, the horsing around. Once, his dad stumbled in at 10 p.m. and woke him. Come on, he slurred. We're going camping. They drove into the hills of Soaguero Cacti to sleep under the stars. One afternoon, his father left to pick up groceries. Romero wouldn't see him again for two years. Within that time, his mother remarried. John Schooneman, 14 years her senior, tried to befriend him. One afternoon, he found the six-year-old boy sketching a Lamborghini sports car at the kitchen table. The drawing was so good that his stepfather assumed that it had to be traced. As a test, he put a Hot Wheels toy car on the table and watched as Romero drew. The sketch was too perfect. Schoenman asked Johnny what he wanted to be when he grew up. The boy said, A rich bachelor. For a while, this relationship flourished, recognizing Romero's love of arcade games. His stepfather would drive him to local competitions, all of which Romero won. Romero was so good at Pac-Man that he could maneuver the round yellow character through a maze of fruit and dots with his eyes shut. But soon, his stepfather noticed that Romero's hobby was taking a more obsessive turn. It started one summer day in 1979 when Romero's brother, Ralph, and a friend came rushing through the front door. They had just biked up to Sierra College, they told him, and made a discovery. There are games up there, they said. Games that you don't have to pay for. Games that some sympathetic students let them play. Games on these strange, big computers. Romero grabbed his bike and raced with them to the college computer's lab. There was no problem for them to hang out at the lab. This was not uncommon at the time. The computer underground did not discriminate by age. A geek was a geek was a geek. And since the students often held the keys to the lab, there weren't professors to tell the kids to scram. Romero had never seen anything like what he found inside. Cold air gushed from the air conditioning vents as students milled around computer terminals. Everyone was playing a game that consisted only of words on the terminal screen. You are standing at the end of the road before a small big building. Around you is a forest. A small stream flows out of the building towards a gully. In the distance, there is a gleaming white tower. This was Colossal Cave Adventure the hottest thing going. Romero knew why. It was like a computer game version of Dungeons and Dragons. D&D, as it was commonly known, was a pen and paper role-playing game that cast players in a Lord of the Rings-like adventure of imagination. Many adults lazily dismissed it as a geekish escapism, but to understand a boy like Romero, an avid D&D player, was to understand the game. Created in 1972 by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, two friends in their early 20s, Dungeons and Dragons was an underground phenomenon, particularly on college campuses, thanks to word of mouth and controversy. It achieved urban legend status when a student named James Dallas Ergbert III disappeared in the steam tunnels underneath Michigan State University while reportedly reenacting the game. A Tom Hanks movie called Mazes and Monsters was loosely based on the event. D&D &D would grow into an international cottage industry, accounting for $25 million in annual sales. From novels, games, t-shirts, and rule books. The appeal was primal. In Dungeons and Dragons, Gygax said, the average person gets a call to glory and becomes a hero and undergoes change. 
In the real world, children especially have no power. They must answer to everyone. They don't direct their own lives. But in this game, they become super powerful and affect everything. In D&D, there was no winning in the traditional sense. It was more akin to interactive fiction. The participants consisted of at least two or three players and the dungeon master, the person who would invent and direct the adventure. All they needed was the D&D rulebook, some special polyhedral dice, and a pencil and paper. To begin, players chose and developed characters that they would become in the game, from dwarves to elves, gnomes to humans. Gathered around a table, they would listen as the dungeon master cracked open the D&D rulebook, which contained descriptions of monsters, magic, and characters, and fabricated a scene. Down by a river, perhaps a castle surrounded in mist, the distant growl of a beast. Which way shall you go? If the players chose to pursue the screams, the dungeon master would select just what ogre or chimera they would face. His roll of the dice determined how they fared, no matter how wild the imaginations. His roll of the die determined how they fared, no matter how wild the imaginings. A random burst of data would rule one's fate. It was not surprising that computer programmers liked the game or that one of the first games created, Colossal Cave Adventure, was inspired by D&D. The object of Colossal Cave was to fight battles while trying to retrieve treasures within a magical cave. By typing in a direction, say, north or south, or a command, hit, or attack, Romero could explore what felt like a novel in which he was the protagonist. As he chose his actions, he'd go deeper into the woods until the walls of the lab seemed to become trees, the air conditioning flow of a river. It was another world, imbued with his imagination. It was real. Even more impressively, it was an alternate reality that he could create. Since the 70s, the electronic gaming industry had been dominated by arcade machines like Asteroids and home consoles like the Atari 2600. Writing software for these platforms required expensive development systems and corporate backing. But computer games were different. They were accessible. They came with their own tools, their own portals, a way inside and the people had keys were not authoritarian monsters. They were dudes. Romero was young, but he was a dude in the making, he figured. The wizard of this Oz could be him. Every Saturday at 7.30 a.m., Romero would bike to the college, where the students, charmed by his gumption, showed him how to program on the refrigerator-sized Hewlett-Packard mainframe computers. Developed in the 50s, these were the early giants of the computer industry, monolithic machines that were programmed by inserting a series of hole-punched cards that fed the code. IBM, which produced both the computers and the punch card machines, dominated the market, with sales reaching over $7 billion in the 1960s. By the 70s, mainframes and their smaller cousins, the mini-computers, had infiltrated corporations, government offices, and universities. But they were not yet in homes. For this reason, budding computer enthusiasts like Romero trolled university computer labs, where they could have hands-on access to the machines. Late at night, after the professors went home, students gathered to explore, play, and hack. The computer felt like a revolutionary tool, a means of self-empowerment and fantasy fulfillment. Programmers skipped classes, dates, baths, and as soon as they had the knowledge, they made games.